let's begin because I got like, a lot, a lot of stuff I want to get. I want to finish the book of Revelation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Are we sleeping over? Me, the first chapter. <laughs> Next verse. Maybe, maybe not the whole book. Maybe just... Father, we are so desperate for you in every way. In our minds, our thoughts, our attitudes, Father, to be positive about uh, the world that we live in with all the, the, the struggles, the difficulties, and the problems, and the negative things, Father, the things that just make us so upset, so angry. Ah, oh, Jesus, let us dwell on you. Let us, let us know that this book was written to tell us what's coming. And we know, we're very, very well aware of what's coming. Lord, help us walk each day with the name and the glory of Jesus before us, that we may proclaim the risen Christ and the soon coming King. And Father, as we open up your word tonight, give us the understanding from your word that changes our hearts and changes our minds and even changes our very souls to know more about you, to more confident in who you are, who you were and who you will be. So, Father, in all these things, just uh, give me the words to speak that I may teach this word worthily. We pray this in the power and the name of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We are in Revelation, first chapter, verse 9. And I want to read a little bit of this, then we'll come back. It starts out, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker of the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, but on the island called Patmos, because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. Now, I want to take those two verses, because then, then we're going to get to the place where, where he's told to write to these seven churches, and, and then we'll kind of jump into that. But I want to kind of go back and, and, and let's unpack some of this for just a moment. We talked a couple weeks ago about John and, and who he is, and we went back to the Gospel of John, and we talked a little bit about this apostle, the last living apostle, but there's, there's some things maybe we don't know about him. You see, at one point in time, um, Jesus made a comment to Peter and the apostles uh, about John. Uh, Can you drink this cup? And he said, well, what, what if, you know, and, and they questioned Jesus, Jesus what, Jesus, what if I want John to live forever? What's that to you? Well, now, this rumor spread. It actually became a rumor during that time that John was not going to die. But at one point, and so, it, it, but they, they tried to kill him on several occasions. At one time, they tried to boil John in boiling oil. We do not know how severe or how close he came. If he was actually put in part of it, we don't know. Or if they, you know, if they if they poured on top, we, don't, we have no idea. If there were permanent injuries from a bowl from boiling oil, can you imagine just how severe that would be in burns. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, okay, so John was not martyred; he was the last living apostle that died of an after death. But wow, what if John carried some scars of oil on his skin? What if he understood, and he did understand clearly, because. These, these 12 other guys, including Matthias, and even, even Paul, that he lived with, he walked with, he knew very, very intimately, were all been martyred for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man, if there's someone who has experience and someone who has a heart for the passion and the reality of the sacrifice for Jesus Christ, it's John. Would you agree with that? Man. So when he stands out here, he kind of gives us an introduction all the way up to there's about what's happening to this. He says, now listen, I, John, and it's interesting because in his apostle, he uses the term of himself what? The apostle whom Jesus loved, right? But here he makes a statement as I'm an apostle. I am John. And so he's going to talk to us and tell us what's happened to him. And he doesn't go into, he doesn't go in here. He doesn't go into anything that's happened to him in the past about, about uh, near-death experiences. Um, he doesn't talk about how he was thrown into, in, into prison there, how he was beaten, how he was tortured, how he was, you know, all this. He doesn't go into any of this. He wants to tell you, and he can't wait to tell you the message of what he's just been given. Now, the reason I find that interesting is because 
Oftentimes, we think that we need to credentialize our faith. You know? Uh, one of the things, Rusty Nelson, a pastor here in town, is a wonderful friend, and, and he, he's, he loves to talk to me because he says, you experienced something that so few people have experienced. You were actually in Southern California during the Jesus movement. You saw it firsthand. And I, I, and I did. We did. I mean, if you went down to the beach in Huntington or Costa Mesa, and you tried to lay on the beach for three seconds without someone coming up and asking you if you knew Jesus and had you 10 tracks, and you were isolated. I mean, because I mean... The people from Calvary Chapel were swarming that place. And these are kids that had come to know Jesus maybe the day before, maybe a week before. They didn't know anything about the Bible. They didn't know anything about the gospel that Jesus says, he saved me, and I wanted to save you. And they were running all over the place. Just, just like, like, like swarming ants or bees telling everyone about Jesus, this passion that they had. I mean, it was really something. You couldn't travel anywhere in Southern California without being inundated by somebody. Hey, you know Jesus? Hey, hey, have you been saved? Been born again? Like, and I mean, yes, yes, you know, I'm a pastor. Well, have you been born again? Well, I'm a pastor, but he's born, you know, you know, and, and the kids that come to my church years ago, yeah, I mean, we were attacked by, you know, 41 raging Christians, new Christians. Did they teach you doctrine? Nope. Did you do Bible study? Just want to make sure I was saved. They wanted to make sure I knew Jesus and I was saved. Boy, boy, do we need that kind of a church again. You know? A few less programs, a few more focus on are you saved. So when John says, I, John, boy, is there a depth in this man that is proclaiming who he is as a credential. That's all he's saying. Hi, John. And then he says this. I love it. He said, your brother, your brother, your servant in Christ. He didn't say an apostle. Isn't that interesting? Because a lot of times in the epistles, Paul writes, I'm an apostle, right? John didn't say that. Listen, I, John, I am your brother. Now watch what he's the brother in this gets fun, fellow partaker in the tribulation. Whoa, ask John on the Isle of Patmos, a not small island six miles by ten miles that is pure rock. Pure rock, nothing grew there. You had to, you had to import everything, everything, food, everything you had to import. It was a, it was a penal colony. And, and it was well known at that time that anybody who was sent there to die lasted about 18 months. John went there somewhere around the time period of uh, when he was about 90, 92, late 80s and 90s. He says probably released at about 92, 93 years old. He was there for three years. So somewhere around late 80s, early 90s, he, he went there. Okay, When people lasted 18 months. And John was there for three years. You think John felt like he was during, in, in part of the tribulation at that time? You think? I'm your brother. I'm a partaker in the tribulation. This is what it looks like for me. Right? But then he comes, follows, after tribulation, he, he's, he identifies all, also with what? And kingdom. Wait a minute. Jesus ushered in what? The kingdom of God, right? I also want to just a real quick footnote on this. This is kind of fun for me. Titus destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, all right? Domitian was Titus's brother that became emperor after Titus. Titus's goal was to destroy the Jews. Domitian's goal was to destroy the Christians, Okay. His goal in life was to destroy the Christians. And so, look, during, during their reigns, all the bosses martyred. During their reigns, they think they're killing this church. They got it destroyed. There's only one guy left. And Domitian dies. And John's released from the Isle of Patmos to spread the gospel. 
Isn't that interesting? You have one, one man. I mean, you think of the 12 apostles and all the things that they did, but honestly, it comes down to one living, one living man. It's not Jesus here, you know, as a leader. So he has responsible carrying this, and the message he's given. Here's the message he's given. So he's a brother in this. It's just in the brother, in the tribulation and the kingdom. Isn't that great? I, 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 that, so, so what does that mean? It means he's a witness with them. He's a witness with them. He's also one to be persecuted with them. He experiences all the things that they do. Okay? It says, and, 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 and perseverance. Now, you know, you know the seven letters of Revelation because you've studied these before. And so what, is it, what does it say in all the letters? He who overcomes. So he sets the precedent here saying, listen, for those who persevere, you see, because he's writing this, right? These, he's not quoting Jesus, but he knows what Jesus said. And Jesus said, he who overcomes, he says, listen, persevere, 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 because Jesus is about to tell you, he who overcomes, he who perseveres. So he's setting the context and the tone for the letters. Okay? The purpose of the, the kingdom here, the kingdom as it's referred to, was the purpose, the purpose of Jesus coming to establish his kingdom. It's the purpose of the, okay? Jesus is the kingdom, right? He comes, he establishes the kingdom, he dies for the kingdom, he is the kingdom. His message, his gospel, he is the kingdom, he's the kingdom, he's the kingdom, right? Okay. All right, so those which are in Jesus, he was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word. What's that? What's that? What's that? What? What's that? Because, well, how do you draw the context of because of the word? Now, John's writing this, what's John saying in John 1 1? In the beginning was what? The Word. So it's no coincidence that John uses this context here that he was in prison because of the Word. And there's an article in front of it, the. Not because of a word, not because of some word, because of the Word. Okay? So he's referring back to Jesus Christ in this as the Word. The Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So what's the calling here? We are to be what? A testimony. This is, the again, this is the whole, the whole message of revelation is gathered up in one word. It's testimony. To testify the things to come. Forget about the things of the past. Let's testify what's coming. Um, I love the I love the uh, the line from Lion King. Where, where Simba is the young the young lion, okay, is really lamenting his past. Just really upset about his past. And I don't know who it is. It's the wise little guy with the stick comes up and he knocks him over the head. He's out. Why did you do that? He says, it doesn't matter. It's in the past. So don't worry about it. <laughs> I love this. It's a great line. Okay. So next time Anna slaps me, you know, she's going to say, don't worry. It's in the past. <laughs> but this is it. It's a testimony. And we testimony is, is of Jesus Christ coming again. Because look, he was and he is, but he's coming again. And this is the book that tells us what we are to testify to. The risen Savior coming again is King of Kings. Okay? All right. Now it says here in verse 10, I was in the Spirit. Is there anybody that has a different translation than that? I was in the Spirit. This, this is the second week I forgot from my Greek text. Okay. This is important. Because the question is, what spirit? Okay. And I want to be clear about this. Um, turn, turn with you just over to chapter 4 of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 2. In fact, let's read, read, read verse 1 just so we establish the context. After these things I look, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking to me, said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in spirit, right? Okay. Behold, the throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. So he's in the spirit. So not, I, I, I want to say this: it's important for us to understand he was not in the he was not in the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say that. Okay, this the spirit is not an article that defines spirit as the spirit of God. Follow me with that. Okay, he was not in the spirit of God. He was not in the spirit of God. But he was in, he was also not in the physical form. You follow me on that so far? So far? Okay. So what does this mean to us? It means that 
that John was transported into a realm by which he was not in the physical form. Now, let me, let me say this. Was Jesus in the physical form? Yes. Was Jesus in the spiritual form? Yes. Okay. Is there a, any point in time that Jesus was in the spiritual form and not in the physical form? Yes. And so the context that I want to draw from is the context at the tomb when Mary comes up to Jesus and wants to hug him. He says, don't touch me. You see, there's a glorification here of Jesus Christ. And, and, and the whole point is, don't hang on to the physical because we're in a spiritual realm. So I want to suggest to you that this spirit that John was in was a spiritual realm that had no physical context to it, but it was not the Holy Spirit necessarily. That makes sense? So if John is saying to us, listen, um, I, I, was, I was in the spirit. Doesn't really carry the message to say, listen, I left this. I was here. In a few chapters, he goes to heaven. He has his vision in heaven. The vision he has in heaven has nothing to do with the physicality of earth. Okay, He's transported to a complete, to the throne room of heaven. He says, I was in the spirit. Well, that's the context, okay, of him being completely aware in spirit and seeing things that may have like physical forms, okay, but not being confined under any circumstance to physical ones. Yeah, all right? So, so the reason I want to say that is because it, it, it's important that we don't get confused that, Paul, that, that John is, is, is swept up and he all of a sudden he's part of the whole, this Holy, Holy Spirit thing. When we die and we go to heaven, we're going to be spiritual beings, right? We'll be given new bodies, but the spirit is going to be so far superior, right, than it is now yes. that you can't even you can't even compare it. And I think that's what we're trying to say here, okay? That John's saying, listen, I, John, I know Patmos, but, but I was taken into a place I'd never been. And a place because he's about to talk to us about where heaven and everything else, we're going, right? So he wants to separate us from the physicality of our limitations of earth. And I, by the way, what day was it? The Lord's Day. Uh, what day is that? <laughs> okay. This is very interesting because the Lord's Day is actually only mentioned one time in Scripture. The Lord's Day and is mentioned of the, of the morning that Jesus Christ was, was resurrected, the Sunday morning. We call that the Lord's Day. This is not that day. This is actually the day of the Lord. Okay. So it doesn't mean I was there on a Sunday. Uh, John didn't catch the church service, the worship service in heaven. Okay. And you, you might probably missed the announcements in the offering too, but that's a whole other thing. Okay. Exactly. So he's saying, listen, I was there and I saw, I saw, what I saw was the day of the Lord. That's when he was there. Now, it's just like, in, 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 let, me, let me rush over here to uh, look at chapter 4, verse 5. And from the throne proceeded flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps and fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne, there was, as it were, and that's a simile, okay, a sea of glass like crystal, and on the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes and behind. And the first creature, okay, so it goes through these four creatures. Okay, now look over to verse, verse 11. The 24 elders are bowing down and are singing, Worthy art thou, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou dost create all things, and because of thy will they existed and were created. Now, look at chapter 5. And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. Now, how did he see that was written right on the inside? Sealed up with seven seals. If it was sealed, there you go. See, if it was sealed, how do you know this? This is a revelation of God to him of what is going on, okay, in the spiritual realm, okay? And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. And I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that's from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with four living creatures and the elders 
a what? A lamb. As if it had been slain. I want to propose to you that John is whisked into heaven and sees the moment when Jesus re-entered the throne room from earth. Why? They fell at his feet and sang a new song, worthy as the Lamb. Can you imagine John seeing this event in heaven? What kind of celebration would there be in heaven? You know? Oh, oh my, right? So going back to the first chapter, we're, 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 again, we're setting context, aren't we? You see? And so we're setting context for these incredible things going on in the spiritual realm. And so saying I was in the Holy Spirit doesn't fit. Saying I was in my spirit doesn't fit. I was in the spiritual realm fits. Okay? You heard a loud voice, like the sound of a trumpet. I want to hear that voice, don't you? I, I just... I wonder what that sounds like. Um, turn with me to Psalm 29. This is great. Because, again, it takes us back to just the richness of how we got to where we are in Revelation. And let's, let's look at Psalm 29 for a moment. And let's think about that John... Here's a loud voice. What's the significance of a loud voice? Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. You already see this is a powerful psalm, right? And you wouldn't say, you wouldn't, you wouldn't read this psalm quietly. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in both array, in holy array. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. Wow. And we're just getting warmed up. Right? The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord breaks the pieces of cedars of Lebanon. And he makes Lebanon skip like a calf. And Syrian like the young wild ox. The voice of the Lord hews out flames of fires. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness at Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer into calf and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everything says glory. Wow. Okay. The Lord sat as king at the flood. Yes, the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. That's the voice of the Lord, folks. Okay. Um. To turn with you real quickly to uh, Psalm 46. How do you read this stuff quietly? How do you read this stuff and get depressed? Right. Look at verse 6. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice and the earth melted. Isn't that great? <laughs> The nations can make all the noise they want. But when he raises his voice, <coughs> I was witnessing basketball practice this morning, and there's a, a coach there, he's a really nice guy. He's about seven, eight, nine feet tall, really nice guy. And uh, he's coaching all this, and he's saying to the guys, I want you to communicate. I want you to communicate. I want you to, so I want you to, every time you're handling the ball, and he's got he's got five teams of five guys out there all dribbling playing. I want you talking about yourself. He says, I want noise. I want to hear you guys. He says, you're going to be playing when there's crowds here. You've got to hear each other. So talk, 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 communicate. And so they start playing. And all of a sudden, he goes, he blows the whistle. He takes a basketball, and he, about a seven-foot frame, throws it to the ground, and goes, boom! And he goes, I said talk! You know, it's like, whoa, okay? And so these guys are running around going, me, 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 I got it, mine, mine. I mean, you, I mean and he says, I'll talk above you. I mean, they were loud, okay? It was, it was right, kind of like a cool thing about, you know what? When you say, make it make a joyful noise. Sorry, I know joyful noise comes out of acoustic guitars, but I don't think that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, I don't, think, I don't think a flute or a lyre is what we're talking about here. 
I think we're talking about making, you know, some kind of, some kind of really let it go. It's the whole band. It's not just with guitar. It's the whole band. Okay. Um, so, so, so there you go. God's voice, the power of his voice. Look, he spoke the heavens into existence, didn't he? And by a word, by a word, he, he, he stopped the storms. Okay. So what's the power of the voice? Whew. So, so what I'm saying is you're seeing such incredible extremes here. Because look, isn't Revelation a book of extremes? Okay. So get used to it. Okay. Now, verse 11, I'm going to kind of go over this because um, it says, He saved him, write in a book what you see, and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, we're not going to dwell on that tonight because we're going to get into those letters, and that's actually where we're going, but I don't want to spend time on that yet because we'll get there individually, okay? So let's go on. And I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstand, in the midst, in the midst, in the center, in the very center, Jesus always wants to be our centrality, right? Where did he say to put the tabernacle? In the what? Encampment. In the center of the encampment, okay? But Jerusalem is where? In the center of, of, of the northern and, and southern tribes, okay? God wants to be in the center. Why is our heart there? That's the center of who we are, okay? So he says, I saw set these seven gold, and in the center of this stands one, like a son of man. Where did we get that from? Our last study. Daniel, right? Daniel writes that Jesus is who? Son of man. Who did Nebuchadnezzar see? I saw the three men in the furnace, and I saw one who looked like what? The son of man. One like the son of man. One like the son of man. This is Jesus. We see this all through the thread of scripture. Daniel talks about he's the son of man. Okay, Jesus calls himself the son of man in the gospels, right? What, what, does that, what does that mean to us? Yeah. And, and, what, and what else? Whose son? Unto you is born in the seed of David a child, right? He will be called Wonderful Counselor. Boy, Mighty God, Everlasting what? Okay. And the government will be on his shoulders, right? Mm -hmm. Unto you a son is born, right? Mm -hmm. what, what's it say? Unto you a son is given, right? Son is given. Child is born, son is given. The child is a human. The son is given is God's son. You have, you have the, 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 the superiority of God, of Jesus Christ, in both the completeness of the fullness of being God and being man in that one sentence. You have the son of man. I love that because he's the son of man. He's God's son. He's God. But what's the value of him being the son of man? He came and he walked with us and he paid the price for us. It doesn't say son of God. It's the son of man. And that identifies him straight out of where he was with us. Fully man with us. And in that fullness of his manhood, he could sacrifice completely himself for us. Wow. So the Son of Man is just a very, very cool, very exciting um, piece that fits here. Okay. Um, and then it says this. Um, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet. Now, guys, when you, when you, when you read the scriptures, ask questions of the scriptures. Why, why, do, why did the Holy Spirit bother telling us that his robe reached his reach feet? Who cares how long the robe was? Was it stylish? Culturally relevant? Woke? Why, so what are we? Why, why did it have to reach his feet? I'll tell you why. Number one, number one, okay. That was the length of a bridal. Right. Okay. That was the length of a bridal robe. It was also the length of the high priest's robe. Okay. But check Isaiah chapter 6. Go to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, chapter 1, chapter 6, verse 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. I saw him. Where was he? Seated on the throne. Lofty and exalted, and the train of his robe did what? Fill the temple. Isn't that great? 
You see, Isaiah tells us of Jesus Christ. And the fact that it's a long robe reaches down to his feet tells us it's a long robe. And it's of royalty. It's of the bridegroom. You know, it's of the high priest. And so in all of this, this one little description that reached his feet is a perfect example to fill all the blanks in Jesus Christ. Isn't it? As God is high priest. Now it sets the stage in the context for him being the high priest. Watch this. And girded across his breast was a golden girdle. What's that all about? Well, take for a second, just a second, okay. The, uh, the high priest, right? Look back at Exodus 28, 15. Exodus 28, 15. God's giving them instructions on the, on the clothing and the garments to make for the high priest. Okay. And in 23, it says, and you shall make a breastplate of judgment. Ooh. Wait a minute. Say that again? You'll make a breastplate of what? Judgment. You ever caught that before? The breastplate of the high priest was the breastplate of judgment? Huh. Okay. And then it worked of a skillful work, and then and it talks about how you make it the ephod of, of gold and blue and purple and scarlet and all these things. We get to Revelation and Jesus Christ, because the high priest had a breastplate of the 12, 12 jewels that represented the 12 tribes of Israel over his heart. Okay? Because the high priest was always to carry the love of his the love of God and the love of the high priest to his people and wear them on his heart. And inside that was the Umin and Thuman that would that would cause the judgment of two different things. Okay? That's how the breastplate of judgment, because you had the, the, the white and black stone in it, and you the high priest would draw and make a decision from drawing from that. Now that was in the first temple period. The second temple period, they actually went to a lottery box. The Umin and Thuman were not used by the high priest in his in his uh, breastplate. It was used in, in a lottery box. Okay. But the point is, I want you to see this is a breastplate of judgment. And here is it's, it's jewels, but all of a sudden now we get Jesus, and it's what? It's of what? Gold. It's refined. It's not precious stones. It's gold. Okay. And it says, it, it's his, it, it's crossed his breast with a golden girdle. Now, they had straps to, to hold the high priest's breastplate on that were not gold. This is gold. Why? Look, he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And he's to be honored above all. Right? We talked last week about not only is he king of kings, but there is no, no king that has ever reigned on earth in all of history that could come close to this kind of king. He's not comparing king to king. He's comparing Jesus Christ to nothing. Right? Okay, so here he is. His head now, we're going to read 14, in, in 14, 15, and 16 together. Once you understand what we're doing in this is this is revealing, because we talked a couple weeks ago about how Revelation is revealing the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay? Revelation reveals the glory of Jesus Christ. Listen to these couple verses and tell me if this isn't revealing the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay? His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. And his eyes were like flame of fire. And his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been caused to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. Now, does that sound like the glory of Jesus Christ? Kind of? You think maybe? Okay. Now, here's the question, and that is, if that's true, Jesus has white hair and a white beard. Sorry. <laughs> For all the pictures. Does he look old? I believe no. What's the white hair and, and white? What, what, what's this all about? What's the white signify? What is the spiritual meaning of white in the in Revelation? Period. Period. Okay. I, now, I'm going to jump ship a little bit on this. This is a cop talk heaven. Okay. Thing at this spot, leave it. They're talking about how you know the, the, the red heifer is going to come and be sacrificed. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll get to that revelation. The red heifer, what's the, what's the rule that makes the red heifer worthy? There cannot be more than three hairs on the entire animal that are not red. Okay. And in, in the last several years, actually, I don't know if you know this, but do you know that the red heifers used to be raised here in Alabama? No, 
Was it Georgia? Sorry, in Georgia? In, in Georgia? They were raised, they were raised in Georgia. And just not, not, a, not long, just a few years ago, they shipped them to Jerusalem or to Israel. They're raising them just north of Jerusalem now. Okay, But they actually were raising them in Georgia. And in, about four or five years ago, they actually thought they had one here in Georgia. It was the red heifer. Because they see the red heifer, a perfect red heifer, as a symbol of it's coming. You see? And what you hear once in a while is, oh, we think we found one. We think we got one. And then a few weeks later, no, we found four hairs. <laughs> You know? So I think one of these days are going to die a red heifer and they got it. You know? <laughs> so we run in there with some clear all and we'll, we'll, we'll get it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. Pull them out. Okay. <clears throat> You're seeing the glory of Jesus Christ in this. That's what Revelation is telling us, is who he is. A couple of things about this, the, the, the white hair. And, and, okay. But then you had eyes like a flame of fire. What is that? Eyes of fire. What is that? Um, I think it's I, I, number one. I think it's purity. I think it's also it's purity. Look, if it is if it is purity, if if the eyes of fire are purity, then Jesus can't look on anything impure, can he? So what does he have to do with us? Make us pure. If we see through the eyes of Jesus. Whoa, that's a different perspective, isn't it? Yeah. They're also refining eyes to make us pure. Eyes of fire. Okay. And then he's got um, feet of burnished bronze. I, I love this because in the tabernacle, when the tab tabernacle was constructed, there's an interesting place for bronze in the tabernacle. At the base of the altar. It was. It was at the base. The great altar was made of bronze. And and the posts that held the curtain, outer curtain up, the bottom post bases were made of bronze. Because the house of heaven could not sit on earth. It had to be refined. Okay? Kind of cool. So that bronze is always a metal of refining. Okay. Um, and his voice like the sound of many waters. We saw that in, 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 in uh, Psalm 29, didn't we? Yeah. Okay. Um, and his face was like the sun shining in its all. Its, oh, no, I'm sorry. I got to hit myself. Sorry. And his, his right hand, he held seven stars. I got to stop. This is, this is too cool to miss. Okay. His right hand, he holds seven stars. Okay. What do we know of seven stars? What? Angels. Angels. What do we, what do we know? Think about stars. What do we know? Seven stars. Anybody ever had a, 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 a Subaru? What's the symbol of a Subaru? Yeah. How many? Seven. The Pleiades. The symbol of a Subaru is the Pleiades. Okay. I never did, but I know the symbols. <laughs> <laughs> you know what other you know, you know what constellation has seven stars in it? The Big Dipper. Dipper. The Big Dipper has seven stars in it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, 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 the reason this gets very interesting to me is because um, my love for Sharon, but, but there's something else, there's something else here. Um. There are five visible planets by the naked eye. Five. Okay. If you add the sun and the moon, the ancients worshipped seven stars. Okay. Jesus holds seven stars now. When you're going to find out, they are angels, right? We're finding out. Before we go there, just for a second, I think there's something very, very curious about this. Because of the seven stars, Orion... Orion has seven primary stars that are the bright stars. The Pleiades has seven primary stars, the bright stars. And the Big Dipper has. When Job questions God, and God finally says, Okay, Job, I had enough. Brace yourself like a man. I'm about to question you. 
Where were you when I set the foundations of the earth? And in that conversation that God has with Job in Job 38 through 40, he says, can you loose the bonds of Orion? Can you bind the Pleiades? Those two groups of seven stars that we see with the naked eye are the only two groups of stars that we can see that are held together by their own gravitational force. And Job was the first book of the Bible written before they ever thought of astronomy. Okay? So the concept of seven stars is huge. Now, one more little thing, little tidbit that I want to share with you, and that is that Orion is in the constellation of the hunter. Okay? The Big Dipper is in the constellation of the bear. And the plate is in the constellation, constellation of the bull. Bulls and bears. And the hunter. Isn't that fun? Just I throw that out. It's kind of fun. Okay. Um, there's so, and, and, and Psalm tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. Boy, do they. Over and over and over and over. Okay. He holds these seven stars, and that's why I think it's so, it's so amazing. If you want to spend another three hours, I can take you into the stars and do some really cool stuff. I'm not going to. <coughs> okay. So, so, and, and out of his mouth came a sharp two edged sword. The sharp two edged sword that came out of his mouth in the Greek, this sword, they had Romans had two, basically two types of sword. That small sword that you pull out of your, you, you would carry on your side, which was a small sword about, about 18, 24 inches long. And then you had the long battle sword. Okay, a very long sword. It was probably about three or four feet long. And this was the sword we're talking about. This type of sword. What would be the significance of a battle sword? Well, it cuts both ways, right? Okay. And what are we about to do in Revelation? Battle. So it seemed to me that the king of kings, that the high priest that comes in judgment to refine, would have the sword to do battle. Right? Okay, and we're going to, we see this repeated and unpacked throughout Revelation as it really gets kind of fun, okay? As this whole first chapter sets the context. Okay. <clears throat> um, and his face was like the, shot, the sun shining in all of its strength. When else do we see someone's face shining? Moses, when? Well, that's, that's another one. Hang on a second. That's another one. We saw Moses. Ten commandments came down the mountain, right? It says his face shone. They didn't understand it all. Okay, it took like three days for his face to, you know, calm down. <laughs> That's probably not a good definition of calming down. Maybe. I love that because it, you know what? I, I'm just thinking about this, and this is forgive me for being stupid and goofy. Um, uh, I'm acting like a politician, but but um, it took the nation of Israel three days after they crossed the the, the, the uh, uh, the sea, three days to start complaining. Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe there's a reason why we meet in the middle of the week. Because we can't get through three days without needing a refresher course on the glory of Jesus. <laughs> it's just, right? And some of us start early on Monday morning and start going at it, you know. Um, some of us can survive till Wednesday night or Thursday or something like that. What is, what is, I, when I get to heaven, I, I do want to ask God one question. Why did we have such a short attention span? <laughs> How come I couldn't stay with you more than three days at a time, you know? Um, but, but we are like that, aren't we? And we have to keep coming back. I had a great conversation with, with uh, uh, Jack Dawes this morning, and he was, he was telling me, he was, you know, he, he just feels such a, a passion to teach these men, he's teaching uh, these students about, about Jesus every day. And, and I said to him, you know what, in that context, church starts after service on Sundays and lasts till the next Sunday morning. You know, we may have a service on Sunday morning, but that's not church. Church is the witness and the sharing of the gospel with the people that need it during the week, isn't it? If, the, if we're not doing that, we are not going to church. We don't have a church if we're not doing that. You know? And so, so we, we see that this uh, uh, um, the shining, the, this presence of Jesus Christ. And then I saw him, and when I saw him, I felt as he as a dead man, 
And he laid his right hand on me. Now the right hand, I love this. In the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, the right hand touching you is the extension of God. Okay? It's the right hand is the right arm. The right arm, the right hand is the arm of strength. So he puts the strength on him. He touches you with the right hand. He heals with the right hand. He leads you by his right arm. You see this a lot in the Old Testament, okay? By my right arm, I led you out. By my right arm, I, I brought you victory, okay? This is the strength of God. So he reaches out and he touches John with his right hand. I love this. And he says, um, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Did we see this picture ever before? Where somebody shown up and he was glowing? Yeah, the angels at the birth of Jesus, didn't they? Right? Do not be afraid. I love this. Now, this is what he says. Now, so what's he going to say to John to assuage his fear? John, don't be afraid. I'm just going to touch you softly. No, don't be afraid. It's all going to be okay. He didn't say that. Don't be afraid. We'll get through this. Doesn't say that. What's he say to boost his confidence and take away his fear? What's he say here? Does that do it? When we are afraid, does that work for us? <laughs> no! No! My question next is, why not? What does that mean? I'm the first and last. I'm the only one that can save. I'm where all of your hope is. I've always been with you, and I'll never leave you. Now, all of a sudden, that... Take care of fear, doesn't it? You see? When you get afraid, just remember first and last. He's the first and he's the last. And in between, I don't have to fear. I'm not afraid of what's going on in Afghanistan. I'm afraid for the soldiers and the people that are whose lives are in danger, Christians around the world. I'm afraid for them. I pray for them. But listen, where this is going, and it just appears every day, you know, where the, the clock is picking up, you know, and time is speeding up faster than ever, and we're coming to the end faster than you could ever imagine. I mean, honestly, you know, I used to think, you know, we're 10 years away. I got to tell you what, if Jesus were to come next week, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, um, Iran's moving a large ship. They say it's filled with gasoline toward Lebanon right now. It's probably filled with rockets. And we have a, we have a uh, uh, sanctions against Lebanon. The ships can't come in. Iran says, hey, they're Hezbollah. They ordered it. Well, we have sanctions against that. What do we do? And Bennett's in Washington today saying to Bush, or say, say Bush, say, right? saying to, to, what's his name? Joe, I can't, he can't remember my name. I can't remember his. Um, uh, Senior Joe, you got to help us stop this. That ship was supposed to sail last week. It hasn't shipped. It hasn't, it hasn't sailed as of this morning. Probably waiting to hear what's going to happen come out of the conference this afternoon. And if they hear what they think you're going to hear, that ship is going to sail. And today they're saying that Iran is about 10 weeks away from nuclear weapons, nuclear capability. Man, I tell you what, I'm not a doomsdayer. And I've always said, I know Jesus is coming, but I'll tell you what, listen, Jesus is coming. And the work for us to do is bring people to Jesus and, and focus. You know, I, I, I told, I, I told my, my groups before, I, said, I would say to my elders in my church, if Jesus walked in this elder meeting tonight and he said to you, Said to us, I'm coming in one year from today. I'm coming. Well, I got, you've got one year left. I'm coming. This date, next year. What would we do differently as a church if we had 52 weeks left? And next week or next month when we meet, we have only have 11 months left. How have we done in that last, that last month? You know? What is our role? What's our responsibility? We got to get down to you know what's what's necessary, what's important, right? It's praying like never before, worshiping, just talking about Jesus, you know. Okay, um, so it's the first lesson, and and I love this. And the living one, Jesus, I'm the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Now, now before we read about the keys, go 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 back just briefly and look at verse 17. 17 it says. I saw my fellow's feet as a dead man. I was as a dead man. I was as a dead man. 
I was as a dead man. John says, right? And Jesus says, I'm the living one. You catch that? John's the dead man. Jesus is the living one. Okay? I think that's very important. I don't, that's not a mistake. It's not there by accident. Okay? John realizes who he is and falls down as a dead man. Jesus says, hey, I'm alive. Okay, there's your promise. <clears throat> and I have the de- I have the keys to death and Hades. Now, I was thinking about this just the other day, and something struck me really, really hard on this one. Okay? And I realized this. Who's the leader of hell? I've always thought that too. This says he's not. This says that Satan's not the leader of hell. And I never realized that. I'm just going, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Take someone like Satan, who is so high, you don't cast him down to be the leader of hell. You cast him down to be nothing in hell. How far is that being fallen? Jesus has the key to heaven. Jesus has the keys of Hades. You know who leads hell? You know who oversees hell? Jesus does. Why do we know that? He's the one who casts people down there. He's the one who locks it up. What's the role of Satan? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. He's the prince of earth. Prince of Right here. It doesn't say he leads hell, does it? I think we got this whole thing mixed up. Talk about falling, right? That's being busted from a four star down to a PC. <laughs> right? Trading. Trading. <laughs> Not even enlisted, <laughs> drafted. <laughs> what would they confuse it to be that these people think God is not? How can he leave hell? But it means a hundred percent perspective. He also is just. He is the judge of all things. He's not going to be down there checking on anybody, right? But there is there is no look. There's no evidence whatsoever here that there's going to be a hierarchy in hell, is there? No leadership. Total chaos. You want to see a glimpse of hell? Look at Washington, D.C. right now. Okay. <laughs> you know? I'm just, I'm, I'm dwelling on this thing. Wait a minute. Jesus has the keys. Jesus is God. And Satan is nothing. He's less than nothing. He can't lead. He's le- Right now, he's leading demons. That's all he's got. And when it's over, he's done. Bingo. The voice that we listen to is Jesus. Wow. And when it talks about hell, it talks about the gnashing of teeth. You know what the gnashing of teeth is out of the Hebrew? You know what that is? I could have been a contender. I mean, that kind of thing, right? All the things you regret. It's it's eternity in regret and guilt and shame. Wow. Also great some teeth over time too. Write therefore the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which shall take place after these things. What's he saying? Be a witness. The word is a witness. Plan words. The written word is a witness. Be a witness. And as for and, and, and as for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven gold lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Now, again, this takes me back to last week, and they say, listen, I know a lot of people try to isolate what are the seven spirits, what are the seven churches, what are the seven lampstands. I want to propose to you that it is simply, it is simply nothing but the completion of all of it. Of the seven is the completion of it all. So write to the seven churches. What do you? What's that mean? You're writing to all the churches, 
right? What are the seven lampstands? They're the lights of every single church that has ever been lit up. Fan the flame, right? And so what are the stars? There's angels over every church that's ever existed. I really think that's what Jesus is telling us. This is what it is. Because, look, churches have come and gone. Churches have risen and fallen. And churches have risen up to great power. And the pastor or some of the church has destroyed part of the church and have been a great falling out of that church. But that church continues. Why? Because it's not, it's not the church of the pastor. It's the church of Jesus Christ. And that church is held together by the Spirit of God in spite of the people. Praise God. Poof. Because without that, we wouldn't have any churches. If our churches were relying solely on the character of the people in it, we couldn't open a single door of a single church. Wow. But the angels of the churches and the spirit of the churches leads the church and leads the people from our sins to glory. Wow. We got to the first chapter. Tired? <laughs> Let's pray. God, sometimes we don't even know where to begin. Your glory is way beyond what we could ever understand. In one chapter of the Bible, we see your glory in ways we've never seen before in all of Scripture. You are glorious. You are mighty. You are almighty. You are the Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. You are everything, everything glorious, everything we hope for, everything we desire, everything we want. And God, we are we're called to be a witness of that. Oh, Jesus, it, it just, why do we make it so hard when it seems like it's so, so easy? Give us the boldness and give us the right words to speak to people in love and compassion of their lives to know Jesus Christ. Father, fill us with the power of your spirit that we may walk like this. We walk worthy. We may walk in the spirit, the spiritual realm, Lord, and live in that realm and not be limited to our physicalness. Father, we, we pray and we give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise in all these things, Lord, and we thank you for this time. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen.